Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of Rebel Wisdom. Are you as well? I not to the same I, extent. Probably not to the same extent. Uh-huh. I I like him, but I I That's I, I like what he's doing. Uh huh. Um, I'm I'm not sure where it's going. This whole meaning crisis thing that that he's talking about. I think the term meaning crisis originated with John Berbecki because. Uh, you know, he's released a series of YouTube videos, Awakening, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, right. and it's become a bit of a cult hit. And I know that a lot of the individuals centrally associated with Rebel Wisdom, David Fuller, but also Jordan Greenhall or Jordan Hall, uh-huh. um, regard Verveke as a very important figure um, and are very influenced by him. I think Jordan Hall, who's quite a formidable intellect, um, thinks that John Verveke is the most important thinker at present as we try to proceed amid current circumstances like in the world. I yeah. think he said something like that. So any, and, uh, and I know that uh, David Fuller said that after Jordan Peterson, John Berveke is the person whose intellectual journey interested him the most. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I think the term originated with John Berveke, but that meme that we're in the midst of a meaning crisis has been internalized by David Fuller. And it's and kind of like what they're centering their whole project yeah. on at the moment, right? Well, it's interesting that you say that. You're probably right, although I actually had not... I, I think I used to have that thought, but now most of the things uh, that I've been listening to lately from Rebel Wisdom are the extended interviews with Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger about... It's not so much the meaning crisis. Th- that's not how they frame it. They're talking about the possibility, I would say, of something like human extinction, or at least civilizational setback, and trying to identify the sources of our current risk and fragility, and then what we might do about it. And that's pretty different from the meaning crisis. I mean, the meaning crisis is more, I think, actually related to what Peterson was talking about. The effect of a scientific materialist worldview insinuating itself into the marrow of Western civilization, leaving a lot of people spiritually empty. And how can we find and provide new sources of meaning without turning our back on what we have learned through the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution? So that to me is more what the meaning crisis is about. Okay. And I think that is pretty central to rebel wisdom, but I sort of think of Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmackenberger as talking about a slightly different set of issues, which is just... So, mm-hmm. like, my understanding then of Jordan Hall mm-hmm. is, is that he's... It's pretty impressive, by the way, don't you think? Yeah. I really, I really, like, yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah, to yeah. meet him. I actually, well, all of them. You know, yeah. Like, well, right, Daniel, too. Daniel. Yeah, like, both of those guys are... Yeah, they have, you better be paying attention. Sometimes I feel like maybe they're gilding the lily a little bit, like, in the quality of the language language that they're using like you really have to be paying attention and and when you're finished with it you're like well i'm not sure that there was that much there that couldn't have been summarized and said a little bit more simply it's really interesting that you say that because they actually talk about that as one problem that exists in the current information ecology i don't know if you saw the interview with daniel schmachtenberger where he talks about how it's very hard to get good information. Information that is true, delivered truthfully, and representative. That is, it's not a true fact kind of divorced from a wider context that's given undue emphasis. So it's very hard to find information that meets all of those criteria. High quality information that will allow us to solve our problems. And then he goes into various reasons why it's hard for us to find that kind of information. And part of it is that like corporations have incentives to provide information that is either false or at least misleading and then individuals might have egoic reasons right so like sure i might want to manipulate you to do something that serves my interest but it involves telling you something that isn't true or i might deliberately obfuscate topics so that you regard me as an authority and give me the associated power i mean he explicitly yeah and and of course that is a huge problem like i mean and especially in the academic humanities where these systems of jargon that are completely, I would argue, without utility. That so, it, yes, yes. So, but it's, those, so it's interesting that you're exactly, making that critique of that. So this yeah. is exactly one of those things that I was enjoying. I like it and I enjoy it. And, and it's kind of like watching professional ping pong. It's, you know, yeah. like, or <laughs> it's like watching Roger Federer play tennis with yeah. Nadal. It's yeah. performed at such a high level 
And I know that if I was in conversation with them, I would just be decimated. Yeah, they just run circles around. Sure. Yeah. But in a way, the problem with that is that when Kelly's in the other room listening, she's like, this is just not pleasant to listen to. Oh, me. interesting. Kelly didn't like it? No. And, and she had more, like, explicit language. As she uh, oh, does. really? I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, but where <laughs> she didn't feel that way uh, about Peterson. Mm. So the nice thing about what Peterson does is he will elevate the quality of his language mm -hmm. and then often pepper it, very often, with uh, very common colloquialism. Yes. Like he'll say, so you might be thinking that. Yeah. You, you, and, and brings you back, so he's not just talking over yeah. your head and impressing. Well, and it's also very important to use very graspable examples to illustrate some of the more abstract if concepts. If you can say it more simply. Yeah, and, and, they, and they often don't do that. Often it's like, okay, so what exactly are we talking about doing here? Here's what I liked about what Daniel was saying. One of the things he was talking about, about an, an existing in a new paradigm, was that like part of the thought process that was necessary might be like something that's not hierarchical in nature, yes. where, where we put ourselves at the top of, of the chain, right. which is, is a maladaptive way of looking at reality and engaging with reality. Do you think he'd say it's maladaptive or just that it's run its course? So what he was, what he was saying is, it's a long way to be thinking that what would the world be like if there were no trees or right. something of this nature? He says, because without trees, I don't exist either. Right. You know, and without those bugs, I don't exist yes. either. And everything kind of works in concert together. Yes. Right. And, and, and one thing we do is we, even with our language, distinguish ourselves from the rest of nature yeah. rather than regarding, we objectify nature. Right. right. I, it versus I, thou, or sure. we are just part of nature. Yeah. I enjoy that part of what he was saying mm -hmm. like, very much and that way of thinking is is very productive yes in a, in a way that i think uh lines up very nicely with with some of the artists slash the philosophers that i like very much that have their concept of universal basic ethics ah uh -huh. right that would put life as the absolute right but not just human life right right so that somebody like um mary oliver as, mm -hmm. as a poet right yeah, yeah. Uh, might say something like, I don't exactly know what prayer is, but I'm standing in, in my doorway, it's open, and, and she's holding a pen, and in the thicket, there's a, a wren. It's singing, positively drenched with enthusiasm. And if that's not prayer, what else would it be? Mm. And I don't know what prayer, and she goes on with all these examples, and it's it has such a reverence for life. Yeah as the absolute right and, and the consciousness of that bird and, right yeah and, and the consciousness right. that you're being it's just like you yeah you you think you're more important than a blade of grass essentially like that leaf that shrivels up in the fall that will be us mm. you know and and the thing that we right right we will go into the ground and, and be dust for worms to feed on and, and that will be our civilization too by well, the way you know um according to spingler how many people would you say in America uh, are optimists? Half? Percentage. It's less. Oh, it's less? Six percent. Oh, you mean, you mean if you poll them? If you poll them, if you poll them and you ask the question, do you think that the world is getting better? Gotcha, gotcha. Right? So you seem so, optimistic right now, not temperamentally right. optimistic. Right. Okay. You know, like, so when they do this poll across the world, even in places uh, you know, no matter what our opinion is of China, right? It's it's seen forty years of in, increased quality of life. Yeah, radically increased. Right. Yeah. Every year. Yeah. Radically, still pessimistic. So the, at, in China, which had the highest rate of optimism, it was only at forty percent. Every. Well, that's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. That's a huge. Difference. But they were the only ones. Everything else, the curve came down to like six. The United States was at six percent. Most people were at like six, three, four, the majority. Mm. So what that means to me is, the connection that I draw from that is, bad news sells. That's why the news is always presenting bad news. It doesn't really help. If you're writing a book and, and you're saying, you know, like, like Steven Pinker, all right? Like uh, Enlightenment. Yeah. He gets no end of criticism. You're right. Well, and they're all very critical of him. In right. Fa in fact, uh, David, one of David Fuller's more snarky remarks when he came was in reference to 
Steven Pinker said, you know, this is a guy who writes a book about how great everything is every five years. Well, um, and, yeah. and, and, but, and, and also, and obviously Schmackenberger and, and Eric Weinstein. I mean, all they're of them. all, they're all, right. all of them, yeah. very critical. But if you look Except at Except Peterson. Peterson is more balanced. He's like, uh, Peterson is sort of a combination of Pinker and the more pessimistic futurists like Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Eric Weinstein. Well, there's part of me, you know, and I want to be careful about this because like that's the audience. Like if you just look at the data, overwhelmingly that's the audience. That's why the news sort of looks like this. That's why if you're in a room with a crowd of people and you start saying the world is getting better and better, nine out of 10 people there are going to like, yeah, you're right. Come at you with yeah. a certain amount of force. It's very psychologically gratifying to ponder the sky falling and to imagine that it is. Uh, Verbeke also says something which I think is, is interesting, mm -hmm. where he says, one way that we have as human beings psychologically to deal with anxiety is to translate that mm -hmm. into fear. And how, why fear becomes productive is because you can identify that. It's not this kind of miasma mm -hmm. of like anxiety that's floating and making you feel, you know, like wait, anxious. Wait, what exactly is the difference between anxiety and fear? Anxiety has is a general sort of feeling and fear can be identified in act. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I see. I think of anxiety is, it, it could be general. It could also be very specific. Like I'm anxious about my upcoming piano recital, um, nervous, you know? right, right, but, right. But okay, but I understand what you're saying. Okay. Well, and, yeah. and this is the conversation that he was having with, with Jordan Hall about that. And Jordan like really liked that, this, this mm. sort of formulation. Mm. I don't think I've listened to that conversation. Okay. With this. And then if you can identify the fear, then you can act upon it. So, right. right? And, and then you can say, that's where the problem is right there. And this is what populist leaders have been able to do and present the other as the problem and go after them. Right. You know, the other being either the elite itself, established in whatever you want to parties, demonize, or like an, an ethnic group. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, I agree. Uh -huh. Or I understand. Yes. So, so in that way, looking back through history, you know, you can you can understand certain good versus evil, us versus them. You know, even team sports type of thing. Even right. Today's politics. Right. Like oh yeah. Polarizing things and Tribalism. making it right. Yeah. Like a, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. I don't think that's a new thing. So when they talk about that's like, a deeply human thing. Right. That's basically a human universal. We, we we evolved tribally, and therefore it's deep within us. Yeah. What I think might be more a part of this thing that could be a part of the meaning crisis mm -hmm. would not be so much that we're losing. Interesting but things. It's actually that we've gained a whole lot of freedom, and that we don't have the restraints that were so a part of our existence for so long. So think about. Oh. Think about the Inquisition. That wasn't all that free, you know, right. for like 700 years, even into the 1900s. Essentially, the way, the way I see it anyhow uh -huh. is that they had power for a very long time. And part of the power is in, in keeping people like ignorant. And part of what the Protestants were doing, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to jump around a little mm -hmm. bit here, mm -hmm. is... Democratizing. Access to the... Sure. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. But you couldn't have done that without the printing press. Right. Uh-huh. And the printing press is like spells doom for like an authority right. that, that depends on an ignorant populace. Right. And, you know, even up into like the late 1800s into mm -hmm. like 1931, where the Catholic Church was responsible for educating Spain, mm. they deliberately didn't teach the children to read. Many priests didn't. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fear was, if they actually learned to read, mm -hmm. they would lead the church. Yeah, so, so I don't know how true that is in Latin America, but certainly I know that that argument is made about the Catholic Church in Latin America too, that the Catholic Church actually had basically a vested interest in the status quo because it was one of the pillars of society, one of the great established establishment forces. Of course. The monarch or the dictator, the Catholic Church, and then the landed elite. And so they had a vested, vested interest in maintaining the status quo and therefore they had an incentive to perpetuate illiteracy and also even to emphasize the parts of the Bible that spiritually valorize poverty. You know, that say, the meek shall inherit the earth. It is sure. hard for, is it very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, etc. Sure, of course. Um, and, and, and then 
to make people yeah. satisfied with their immiserated lot is the argument. I don't know how. Well, it's 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 part of the argument. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons uh, for the Protestant Reformation is that the Catholic Church was selling indulgences. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a huge problem. Yeah. And you don't have a choice. It's like you pay or you're going to hell. Right. 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 And, and, and if you buy it, yeah. You, you think there was a meaning crisis then? I would think so. Because they were really exploiting the poor. Mm -hmm. The very people that they were pretending. But it's not that society was problem free or exploitation free or anything like that. I think that's more that the vast majority of people deeply believed in the cosmology of the Catholic Church. That is, they deeply believed. The problem that I have with that is it's, just, it's just hard the, to separate that when there's like, like the guillotine or the rack or the well, Inquisition. But if, but, really but, but if, but if, but if the Catholic Church is saying, if you buy these indulgences, you can ensure your place in heaven and maybe ensure a place in heaven for your heretical mother or father or brother or sister, that's only going to be effective insofar as the person you're saying that to deeply believes that there is a place called hell or, and that the Catholic Church might be right. Well, so, right? so well, so here's why. Mm, why, why else would people buy the indulgence? Well, so, the so let me give my reason why okay. I, I feel like they might. Because they're terrified. Of what? Like, you mean, uh, like, of what? They, they had the rack. They're terrified of hell. They're not terrified of, I mean... Of what, being what? tortured half to death? Well, if that was happening, but, like, the selling of indulgences, as far as I know, was not, here, buy this indulgence, and if you don't, we're going to torture you or kill you or well, arrest you. It's just that if you don't, you and maybe members of your family are going to be more likely to go to hell. And again, like, there wasn't a threat of torture. There was a threat of hell. And people believed in that whole worldview, and therefore it was effective. Wh which, so, isn't, like, which isn't precisely a meaning crisis. Well, you could so, argue that that's a very evil, manipulative thing to do on the part of the Catholic Church, especially to the extent that the people making those arguments were bullshitting. So here's where I would draw, like, an analogy to mm -hmm. that. There are people at work, and there's a conversation that takes place politically. There are a certain percentage of people that will not speak up because they uh, know they're going to be ostracized. They know it will be problematic. If you don't go along with the program, zip it up and do right. it. You can be fired. You can be... Or like, ostracized. I mean, it's, or just, ostracized. it's just like the, the contemporary academic context or something exactly. like that. It's the, tyranny of, it's the tyranny of custom and of... Of the authority. Yeah. Of the power. But not just the power, your friends and family who will ostracize you if you if you blaspheme. Okay, fair enough. Although, see, I think that, again, I don't think the argument that there's a meaning crisis is an argument that pre-scientific revolution Europe was exploitation-free, was tyranny-free, was free of all kinds of informal constraints on freedom of thought. The meaning crisis is a different claim, I think. A large percentage of the population can think there is a meaning to their lives, but still there can be a ton of other problems. So the yes. meaning crisis is like a specific kind of problem. Now, I think, they, I think people like John Vericki, Peterson, I would argue that it may be the biggest problem of all, bigger than some of these other problems we're talking about, like the problem of constraints on people's freedom of thought, for example, or exploitation on the part of powerful institutions. Although exploitation on the part of powerful institutions if carried to a sufficient extreme is like so, even worse. So maybe you could sketch out one or two problems that you see, like mm -hmm. today, that, that you, you think are really legitimate problems that are in alignment with what Verveke is saying about mm -hmm. the, the loss of meaning in people's lives that we're struggling with today. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. so what do you think? So the meaning crisis and the crises and problems that people like Schmachtenberger and Hall talk about are largely separate from each other, although I know that they talk to each other and there are resonances. There's a fair amount of overlap yeah, that, sure. that happens. To yeah, them. I mean, no, no, and that's certainly true, especially when you get into Hall and Schmachtenberger's vision of the future and like what we need to do in order to deal with various problems. I think they draw pretty heavily on ideas either of John Verveke or ideas that are similar to his. But the, the basic problem that Hall and Schmachtenberger are identifying is not the meaning crisis, I think. It's more that we might kill ourselves. We might kill our civilization or even go extinct. So okay, so on the meaning crisis, which is a different thing that I think Verveke and also Peterson is more interested in, what are we talking about? 
the term meaning does do a lot of work for me, and I probably need to think more about what exactly that means. It does a lot of work for Peterson. So Peterson, mm -hmm. meaning is at the very center, literally, of his metaphysics. Okay, so let me back up for a second. You might argue that like there are two types of ontologies you might have. One is a scientifically a scientific materialist ontology or metaphysics, and one would be... We might say broadly a phenomenological mm -hmm. ontology or metaphysics. Okay, so, so the question in metaphysics is what is the fundamental nature of reality? What, yeah. it, what is, right? And one answer to that question is that the fundamental nature of reality is whatever the physicists say it is, right? And then everything else is like epiphenomenal to what's going on at the quantum level, right? Okay. So consciousness, for example, is an emergent property of matter interacting in certain ways, right? Like once information processing reaches a certain level like it does in the human brain and also in other animal brains, you get this thing called consciousness, which is, which is just subjectivity, the capacity to have experiences. So if you think that consciousness is a byproduct of physical processes, right, material processes, you might think, for example, that once AGI is attained, artificial general intelligence, at some point consciousness is just going to appear and computers that have reached a certain level of general or fluid intelligence. But in any case, so the scientific materialist view is just the view that fundamentally what is is whatever the laws of nature are, whatever the physicists tell us is okay. true. Um, and, and then phenomenologists, I could be getting this wrong, but phenomenologists and very importantly Heidegger, but then there are many different sub-branches of phenomenology. So I think like a Christian metaphysics is actually a type of phenomenological metaphysics. And I think basically what that means is that what is real, what is most fundamentally is experience or consciousness. That consciousness is not should not be regarded as ontologically secondary to the physical world. So Peterson and Pope Benedict. So Pope Benedict said that to believe in God is to believe in the ontological primacy of logos over matter. Peterson has said it is imperative that we regard living spirit as having ontological primacy over dead matter. And Peterson, in numerous ways and conversations, has challenged this notion that consciousness should be regarded as like an epiphenomenon or a byproduct of the material world or material processes. Now, how does this relate to meaning? Okay, so Peterson thinks that consciousness, subjectivity, experience is the most real thing there is. It's more pain. pain, exactly. Yeah. But pain, but the one thing he thinks that might be more real than pain is meaning. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, he says that, that if you deny meaning, you can't deny it when you have pain. No matter what you say you believe, that's if you're right. in pain, you can't deny the fact that you're in that's pain, right. right? So he says that's not a bad place to start with your metaphysics. But he has said in other conversations that the one thing that might be even more real than pain is the thing that allows you to transcend pain, the thing that gives you the strength to endure despite the inevitable pain of life. And that is meaning, not happiness, but meaning. So what is meaning? He said a lot of different things about it. I don't totally understand. I guess you could circumambulate the concept and hit it from different angles. One thing he has said, and I have taken this on as a personal mantra, although I don't really live it, but I'm trying to proceed toward living it, is that life is only meaningful to the extent that you take responsibility for the alleviation of suffering, to the extent that you take responsibility for the well-being of others. You can do that in many different ways, yeah. but only to the extent that you make sacrifices for other forms of life will your life be meaningful so that's one notion of what meaning is another another thing he has said is that meaning is associated with flow states when you're exactly on the border when you're dealing with as much chaos and unknown and complexity as you can handle so you're not being overwhelmed by complexity but you're also not just comfortably in the known right sure so a good example is jazz improvisation or right. something like that or the one we watch the olympics or yeah, yeah right he's given that example well, when we're playing when we're having an amazing point yes. playing tennis yes, or something yes. like that and there are tons of examples right like when i'm having a really good class and like just the, the ideas are flowing and i'm well, really it's that yeah. it's that state that is the thing that we're attracted to when we watch people do yeah, it. Yeah, right. So, like, he, he says what's so alluring about the Olympics is, is you're watching people 
at the height of its pinnacle performing right on the razor's edge and you don't know if they're going to fall off or not and it's so captivating because there it is like, like yeah and they're, yeah. in, in they're right. perfect harmony like all elements are working in perfect and they're harmony. stretched to their absolute limit yes. and they execute it and when they and when they do well and like we all just spontaneously go insane. And like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Like watching Roger Federer play. Exactly. Just, yeah. 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 Like yeah. an so, like or Djokovic like win a yes. forty shot rally with right. a backhand down the line. But, but I think that actually the first part about having responsibility for and this is part of why Peterson thinks it's so important to have children. Having a child forces you to take responsibility in a different way for the well being of others. Like in Some a way. That, people. Some right. people. Yeah, some people. Right. But, but some it, people, it, it definitely would for me because I'm like, sure that it would. Like it would make, and that's why I want to have kids. And it's a big part of why. Um, and so, w why I think it would is because there has to be some sort of element in place first mm -hmm. that that Daniel Schmattenberger is speaking about. Like it doesn't help to just think of yourself as this isolated atom. Very often, people act as if they are are selected species, right? Not case-selected species. Ah, uh -huh. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so this becomes like problematic in a way. Ordinarily, you might be thinking, sure, uh, it's, it's an obvious conclusion that, that you have a child and you care and you give up part of yourself and this is why you had a child. But there's plenty of evidence to the contrary. That, that a lot of people don't. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. And it's that evidence. But a lot of people do. A lot of people, lot of people do. do. Oh, yeah. oh, sure. I mean, know, my, my parents certainly did. Well, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. You know? uh, but, but a lot of parents don't. Sure. Yeah. And, and that is one of these things that I think might could be lumped into that category mm -hmm. of, of that meaning crisis. Well, yeah. Oh, oh, oh no. I, th I think so. You know, yeah. That, like um, how, you, how we relate to each other, but also how you relate to, to uh, your children, but also the concept of... of what the responsibility of our institutions of authority really is. So most people will send their kids to school, for an example, and, and expect that the school will teach them to read. Right, right. The school will teach them to write. Yeah. The school will teach them math. Then they'll blame yeah. the school and they'll say, you know, the schools, obviously our schools are failing. Right. It's a mess. Look at government schools, look at all this. And I'm thinking, absolutely not. What's really failing is the family environment. It's us as people. Yes, it's, it's, it's the parents. I mean, like, right. but I completely agree. If a kid is raised in the right environment, you can't make him poorly educated. There's nothing you can do to combat a very healthy, information-rich, stimulation-rich, familial environment. So what I, what I love about yeah. what, what Peterson yeah. is saying is that he's lining up with personal responsibility. Right, very much you know, so, yes. And, and saying, fix yourself. And I think that that's very simplified and it can speak to people immediately. But, but what's crazy is that, because if you just reduce it, not that you are, but like if you just reduce it to fix yourself, clean your room, it's like anyone could say that. What's unbelievable about Peterson is that somehow he managed to make a lot of people shift their actual behavior. It's like somehow he convinced them that it is in their best interest to pick up a heavier burden. He's, he works it through. Yeah, he I mean, doesn't he, just leave it there. Not at you all. Know? And that's yeah. what I love about what he's doing. He's, he's speaking at that level and then he brings it down so that the people appreciate what he's saying and they can get something from it and realize how they can improve the quality, where they can go. People have a sort of natural tendency in this kind of environment to kind of blame somebody for their own shortcomings and, and claim victimhood. You know, like if my parents would have done this, I wouldn't have been like this. I could have been better. Look at somebody else. Look at that. And what I like about what he's doing is he's saying, like, fix yourself. The most fundamental thing that I've taken from Peterson, other than always be truthful, is to yourself and to others, is basically never complain but it's deeper than that. It's like, obviously, if someone is being cruel to you, you can reasonably, justifiably criticize them for doing so. If someone is treating you unethically. But a lot of the suffering that you experience in life, a lot of the failure, is just due to your own limitations, bad luck, other people being better, etc. And even when people are just cruel or mean or unfair to you, how do you respond to the suffering that comes from all, this, all of those different things? Well, like... You have a choice. You can either demonize 
other people unfairly, you can become resentful, embittered, or you can accept, nobly bear the suffering, make goals, and proceed toward them, and, and not indulge in any kind of blaming, scapegoating, self-pity, etc. And the story of Cain and Abel on Peterson's interpretation is fundamentally a story of that. Cain made sacrifices to the gods, reality didn't break in his direction, and he became embittered and killed his brother. Um, you can do that, or you can do the other. What Peterson also adds to that is, is that act as if everything that you do has meaning. Right. So even if you're the victim of injustice, that doesn't entitle you to create chaos. Right. You plant seeds of virtue even if you've been the victim of injustice. Right. And that's the better path forward. Right, just because someone else tilted the world toward evil, you're just going to tilt it even more toward evil. Sure. Instead of tilting it a little bit back toward good. Right, so um, even yeah. if the immature sort of response to injustice or unfairness, the next level up might be to be okay with that. That sometimes you're lucky and they're not. Right, that's life. And, and yeah. that is life. As you always say. Yeah, yeah that, that's right, which is a very kind of like stoical kind of way yes. of, of looking at things. Right, and, which is also experiencing a rebirth, stoicism. Well, reality will smack you in the face. And you can create many layers between yourself and reality, and that can last for a while, but ultimately... Right, right. Like, yeah. and, and so that the problem with... So when he was speaking with Ver, Verveke, and they were talking about like hope, mm -hmm. and, and Verveke said something that, that I kind of agreed with and a lot, and, and that is he's kind of been critical and, and not really happy with it, the notion of hope because there's a certain amount of, of ambiguity associated with that. Like it can be taken in different ways right and and used for people to just sit still and and wait for the almighty to do something for them well like the crisis is here but like i'm just gonna wait because yeah things will get better because i i believe that's a maladaptive way of moving forward right and it's sort of lazy thinking you could also use that as a justification just to be lazy right? well a part of the wisdom that's a, that's been a part of our meaning making like mm -hmm. engagement with phenomenological experience to philosophize about how we might best move through life. What, what he was saying is mm -hmm. you, can, you can take the wisdom that comes from these traditions mm -hmm. and boil it down to like simple rules. And, and then it becomes people just following the rules without much thought and that becomes lazy thinking. We are in this kind of thing that's larger than us and it, it's not helpful to be in an adversarial sort of relationship with it. It's almost impossible for us to sort of conceive of what's coming next. Right. But we could make ourselves better people. And he uses this metaphor of, of a caterpillar that looks, it's though, looks as though it's oh, consuming yeah. everything. And then it turns into this butterfly and it pollinates. You could never know looking at the data based on this one creature that that's what was going to happen. But that's how life acts. There's a kind of hopeful way of looking at humanity. And we've always been able to figure out a way. Never before in the history of humanity have humans lived this well, ever. It's not that we don't have problems. We have so much freedom now. Mm -hmm. We have an abundance of things. And so purchasing things only gives us a sort of, sort of temporary high. It doesn't fill us with meaning. Right. The meaning might be something that's wrapped up in that pursuit of flow, like in the thing that, that you're passionate about that would put you in that state and that you'd move forward in life as though everything that you do has meaning. Getting into a flow state and taking responsibility for the well-being of others are two pretty different things. Um, well, I and, kind of think they're, they're similar. How does getting into the flow state with jazz improvisation Oh, sure. So and I could use it for everything. Do you, do you mean in doing that you're taking responsibility for the well-being of, of others by generating beauty? Yeah, that, that sure. Mean, okay, fair absolutely. enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Candide would say something like cultivate your own garden, right? Mm -hmm. And in that way, your excellence, it's the Aristotelian ideal of yeah. love. It's your excellence inspires other people to lift their level of play. So it's not that like when I listen to Daniel speak and he's just so beautifully fluid or Jordan or, you know, uh, even Jordan Peterson or Jordan Hall or, yeah. or any of them. And they're just so, it's not that I wish that I was an academic. It's like, or if I listen to a piece of 
beautifully composed like classical music, you know, and I think it, it's not that I decide that I'm going to quit what I'm doing. It's that I say, golly, I wonder if I could perform like painting at that level. I wonder right. if I could come up with ideas that would move other people in the world as much as I'm moved by this. Could I yeah. perform it? And if, if the, the only thing is you could enter a flow state in the privacy of your own garden without anyone ever knowing about it. And it would still be, I think, a meaningful experience on the Petersonian definition, but I don't see how that would involve... In his definition, he would say, at least don't do any harm. Well, right? so, like you... well, no, but again, how do you get meaning? And there may just be different ways to do it, and to some extent they may overlap, but when so, you stretch then... yourself to your fullest capacities, take on as much complexity and chaos as you can, but still maintain control, and that would be like jazz improvisation or athletic excellence. It's one way of attaining meaning, and of course that can have a really positive effect on others. But another way of getting meaning, and this may be more generally applicable to people, more important, and also just more applicable to the average day of most people, is taking responsibility for the well-being of others. And virtue itself is largely just cultivating patterns of thinking and behavior that involve sacrifice for the good of those around you. It's impossible for you to meet the needs of every child in your class. Mm -hmm. You can't teach to every child and be sure that they equally grasp the importance of your message and what you're trying to do. For, it's, it's just not possible. In the same way, it's not possible for like any teacher to be able to meet the needs of 30 different kids in a public classroom. To try and give yourself that task to serve other people in that way, it's, it's an impossible task because you, you can't. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't even do that one-on-one -on -one in a relationship. You don't know what the other person needs. The best that you can do, and this is why I, I see... Aristotle, working this out at his highest ideal, mm -hmm. is, is that the best that you can do is, is perform at your highest level. And that's why mythology, legends, heroes, the Olympics, mm -hmm. great athletes, great musicians, when people perform superhero movies, when they perform at the highest level, yeah. it inspires Millions of people. This is what like Ayn Rand would say about yeah. heroic literature. Yeah. It's not so much that you're going to go out and, and face some villain, then save the universe. It's that individually in reading that, you pull the concept of what it is to be heroic through and into your own into life. Your life right. And yeah. so as you're cultivating yourself and your excellence and your merit that inspires other people to lift their level of play. That's right. a different formulation than what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... And you're not doing any harm in that way. That's what she would call the virtue of selfishness. You're not, you're deliberately not doing harm, but your excellence inspires other people. To, that's why we go to the museum. It's why when people travel, they want to see the Sistine Chapel. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree that people who attain excellence and stories about such people, true or fictional, are unbelievably inspiring. So here's another leap that I'm going to make okay. regarding that in, in the change of the middle-aged thinking mm -hmm. in regard to humanity, where the concept of the divinity of man could not even be a possibility. But that's the title of a book written at the beginning of the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And what they do in the Renaissance, which is the real shift, is that they, they start looking at mankind as an agent who is free to create his own destiny. Prior to that, that concept would have been blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Who the hell do you think you are? Mm -hmm. God makes the plan. You think you can change God's plan by your free will? What the hell? In the Renaissance, they change that formulation. And no doubt, as soon as that thought is starting to permeate the atmosphere, that's when the Inquisition takes place. So the two things are running hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But it's shortly after that that you're going to have the, 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 the whole curve of where we get to the modern era. In the Renaissance, what they're doing is they're exercising the full, this is the wrong word for it, but hubris. Mm -hmm. The full confidence that they are going to see what they're capable of and they do magnificent things. And through into the Baroque where 
it's, it's somewhat of the, the highest achievements, artistic achievements ever in the history of humanity. And if I would look at the, the meaning crisis, it's when that flips. It's after World War I, when the postmodernists, the things that like would, would happen now, that they take that whole thing, that the, the potential and the trajectory of man to, to do wonderful, great, miraculous things that come up with science. Incidentally, little side note, Who's the guy who effectively came up with uh, a vaccine and a cure, really, for the plague? I don't know. Mm, yeah, and we don't. And that's, mm. that's because it's happening, like, closer. His name is, is uh, Valdemir Hafkin. Mm. And what he did, because he's overlapping that time period, mm -hmm. is he literally sacrificed himself. He would come up with things and then inject himself. Mm. And, and he came up with a vaccine. The power of the individual to rise up and be heroic and inspire other people to greatness is part of this thing that comes from the Greeks, wakes up again in the Renaissance, leads to the Enlightenment, to greatness that we have today, that I believe that, you know, is a part of the, at least the early pioneering spirit of, of you know, America. Mm -hmm. And if I was looking at a meaning crisis, it's something that we, we question, we question today. Mm. That we're, we're really critical of the colonial gaze. But it's that age of discovery that led to everything that we have, to the improved quality of life for humans across the entire planet. So I think you're saying that we no longer live in a culture that celebrates excellence or a culture that celebrates the values and virtues that gave rise to the great bounty that we... We're struggling with that. Yeah. We're and, struggling. That's why... And, and you would pinpoint that as the source of the erosion of those values. Again, the values of celebrating excellence, personal responsibility, discipline, lifting yourself up by your own bootstraps, being creative and entrepreneurial, making the most of your potential, all of those values that people kind of sneer at now. Are you saying that those values, that worldview is eroding? It's been eroding for the last roughly 100 years, and that's at the center, or that's the primary cause of the meaning crisis? I don't know. I think, like, um, I want to be careful because I, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to paint with a broad brush. But at least that's part of what's going on? I, I, I think that we're we're uh, struggling with it, you know? And, and I think that one of the struggles, and, and it's one of the struggles with the free market is, as well. And, you know, like I'm, I'm one of these people that might be like a label as a market absolutist, uh -huh. right? But um, it pays to send a message to a large group of people that are pessimistic. Oh, yeah. And, and you'll make money that way. And you can, right. and, you know, yeah. and, and so... Conflict and disaster sell, yes. Right, so... And, Which and, is what you were talking about at the beginning. And, and the few people that are performing at this peak, they're a minority. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of commercially pays to target them as oppressors. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, right, you can play into people's resentment and bitterness and envy, and, yes. And, and so that's where, like, I would say, like, my criticism... Would, would lie with a PBS hit piece. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean... And no, 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 right. But I, but I guess what I'm, partly what I'm trying to do, though, is like relate all of this. You asked me what I thought the meaning crisis consisted in, according to Verbeke. And I was admittedly slowly building up to an answer by starting with what meaning is and drawing upon Peterson to answer that. And then we kind of went into this... Uh, into this other conversation that isn't unrelated, but I'm trying to bring it back by, by saying that I think that one reason why you're talking about these issues, that is the fact that certain cultures, probably most quintessentially the ancient Greeks, but also Europe during the Renaissance and afterward, celebrated excellence. And then also a lot of personal virtues that gave rise to incredible innovation and abundance. So the celebration of excellence and the celebration or the inculcation, the widespread unironic belief in virtues of personal responsibility and creativity and dynamism and, uh, and entrepreneurship, all of those things have been part of our cultural ancestry, but they're eroding. And, and then we could get into why. And part of the reason is that it actually is 
profitable for some media companies to demonize those who succeed, for example. There would be lots of reasons why, but you think that those values, et cetera, are eroding. And again, that, that may be at least one significant contributor to a kind of demoralization. So, right? Well, Am I wrong? Close. I want to be careful not to say that I feel like they're eroding. There's a part of me, like if, oh, if okay. I'm going to be like, you know, hyperbolic about it, you know, then, then I would say, you know, like we're losing a sense of that. Mm -hmm. But then like there's another part of me, you know, when I read the comments, like under an interview with Elon Musk mm -hmm. and, and people are just in love. Yeah. You know, right. and, and so like it, it, may, it may be more of an elite phenomenon than a mass phenomenon like this. Well, I think the narrative. You know, that... There's a like there is a growing swell. So I, I, I don't want to say that they're okay. voting. Like I, I okay. think that the challenges. They, they might be they might be somewhat at risk or something like that. I'm not I'm not sure. Some days I, I might be a little bit more pessimistic than others, but in general I'm kind of optimistic about things. And okay. Well, then why then why did you bring it up in response to the? Uh, well, I think it's the discussion of the meaning crisis. Because I think that one of the things that is related is that... Related to what? The meaning to crisis? the meaning crisis uh -huh. is that we struggle with it. Is so we struggle with so these... We struggle with... There are elements that are at play that are trying to undermine the very notion of, of goodness, you know, of a good message, of things that would help you. Because, right. as, as you were saying like earlier, right, like they, they have a deliberate intention to keep you down. Some powers will deliberately manipulate a situation just for clickbait, just, just to muddle up the pie, just to create chaos because it's, it's advantageous for their bottom line. Yeah. That's a part of existence and maybe that's the part of existence that is a part of the meaning crisis is the part that has always been there. It's a thing that we've always struggled with. It's not something new. In my view, we're kind of jumbling things. So just for example, like the fact that so much of the information we consume is not high quality information, either because the corporation disseminating it has incentives that aren't just telling a true representative story, or because the individual disseminating it is trying to manipulate or puff himself up. Okay, that is, that is a phenomenon. Schmackenberger who is the person who talks most about that. He doesn't talk about it in the context of a discussion of the meaning crisis. He talks about it as part of the problem with society today. We have these huge crises on multiple fronts, and we don't know how to generate high-quality solutions to those multiple crises. And one of the reasons is what you and I just said, that a lot of the information out there is not actually high-quality information because of the incentives of the agents delivering it. And so we have to find ways of generating higher quality information, leading to higher quality solutions to these imminent crises we face. But again, the imminent crises that they're talking about are, are basically like AI, CRISPR and you know, bio warfare, nuclear proliferation and fossil fuel emissions leading to the degradation of the, sub, of the natural substrate on which we depend. And like all of these crises due to humans' exponential growth on a finite playing field coming to a head and are not being able to generate solutions to deal with them. But the meaning crisis, which again is something that I think like mainly Verveke talks about, I don't think that he would say, I mean, what, what you say is interesting. I hadn't thought about this before. If one source of meaning is excellence, and excellence does come from stretching yourself to your absolute limits and making the most of your God-given abilities in order to generate edification and beauty for others and to inspire others to make the most of themselves. Yeah, if you live in a culture that doesn't celebrate that, that is prejudicial to meaning making. So one way that life is meaningful is by really performing at your peak right? Generating beauty and edification and entering flow states as you do so. Another source of meaning is Peterson, I think centrally focuses on, is on the adoption of responsibility. That's what he thinks the distillation of the Christ story is. It's a person who took on the sins of the world, who picked up a cross and took maximum responsibility for the suffering of, of all people and sacrificed his life for that purpose. And if we're going to try to do that in our own lives, we have to find ways of doing it. One way is to be a really good parent, 
to be a really good partner. Generally, I, again, I said this before, but just being a virtuous person means restraining yourself and making sacrifices for the benefit of those around you. I mean, that's in a sense what virtue is. So if meaning comes from that, from the adoption of responsibility, of personal responsibility, I guess you were also addressing that. You were saying that like notions of personal responsibility are also coming under attack. And it is true that like, you know, if you emphasize the importance of personal responsibility now among the commentariat and the kind of educated classes, a lot of them will kind of think that you're victim blaming. And I mean, I'm not trying to reduce Peterson's account of what constitutes a meaningful life to these two things, but you, there might be some value in just reducing it to taking responsibility for the well-being of others, for the alleviation of suffering and pursuing excellence intellectually, artistically, athletically, etc. And the two aren't totally unrelated, but to some degree they're separable. I guess one way of summarizing part of what you were saying is that like both of those things, excellence and personal responsibility for yourself and then for, for your environment, for the people around you, that both of those values might be at risk and that that could lie at the heart of the meaning crisis. I mean, that kind of makes sense. Postmodernism attacking the idea of like hierarchies and excellence and something like political leftism, especially in America, I can't really speak for other countries, but here, if you talk about personal responsibility and the importance of it, you're immediately thought of as like someone on the right, right? That's not sort of a, that's viewed as a Republican talking point. And anyone who talks about it is not giving due emphasis to the ways in which an oppressive context prevents people from flourishing. I think that there's something to that. The, the things I wanted to add, though, are two things. First of all, Verveke, I think, would argue that the meaning crisis largely has to do, and P I think Peterson would argue this too, that the meaning crisis largely results from the fact that scientific materialism, going back to what I was saying about metaphysics, that scientific materialism has become the dominant metaphysical view of our civilization, of even ordinary people. Are you at all familiar with Charles Taylor? No. Okay, Charles Taylor is a, he's a very influential philosopher. I think he might consider himself like a Hegelian. He's a Catholic. And in his book, The Secular Age, I think he argues that basically, just to be very crude about it, before 1500, a scientific materialist worldview, a, a worldview that really denied the existence of a supernatural deity wasn't really an option for the vast majority of people. It's not like there were tons of people who were thinking this, and almost as you were suggesting, just waiting to say it. That like, it just wasn't really an option. It wasn't really in the set of possible beliefs that most people could hold. And he says that since 1500, again, to be crude about it, increasingly that has become an option. Now it's become the dominant way that we look at the world, that it is fundamentally physical and material and everything else is epiphenomenal. And that as a consequence, we are buffered. Like he has this notion of the buffered self, that we are cushioned from, buffered from, distant from, removed from the world of myths and gods, the kind of mythopoetic realm. That's not entirely true, but certainly the, the mythical realm, right? Anyway, my point is that I think both Verveke and Peterson would argue that the meaning crisis fundamentally follows from a shift in medical, metaphysical viewpoints. We've gone from regarding the spirit, human consciousness, human behavior, human action, human decision-making, and all the questions that arise therein. How should I act? Um, what is at stake if I act wrongly? That used to be metaphysically primary. Now it's not. Now what is metaphysically primary is science. And I think, and, and so Verveke talks about um, the two-world view, which is the old view, that there's the, it's kind of a, almost a pl platonic view, um, but, but, but more just the idea that there is the world we inhabit and then there is the world unseen. And the world unseen is hugely important, perhaps more real, more important than, than the seen world. Um, and he says that the two-world notion has completely evaporated. It's similar to Peterson saying that a kind of Christian metaphysics has given way almost entirely to, to what he would, I think, that some derisively refer to as scientism, just a scientific materialist metaphysics. Um, and, and now I come to my final point about this, which is that if you believe that what is fundamentally real is just quarks and, you know, quantum dynamics, and that everything else is just kind of a byproduct of that, 
that can lead to a certain nihilism. It can lead you to think that nothing that important is really at stake in human life. That is, so before I might have been violating a sacred rule. I might go to hell, you know? I might, um, it's very important that I behave rightly. A lot is at stake. Um, I have to behave virtuously. I have to take responsibility. Um, now it's like, if I don't, that's kind of a lifestyle choice. Nothing is ultimately at stake. And Peterson, all, I think Peterson really gives that viewpoint its due because as you were saying earlier, he says, you have to decide. Are you going to regard everything you do as important and meaningful or are you not? Just choose. See how it goes for you. Right. There's less responsibility with the latter, but there's also less meaning. With the former, there's a lot of responsibility and difficulty, but there's more meaning. But anyway, like I... My point is, before the erosion of, b before the entrance of a more scientific materialist metaphysic, metaphysics, choosing the second option I don't think was as much on the table for people, right? Because they really believed that something divine and eternal was at stake in the way they moved through the world and the decisions they made. So the possible erosion of the celebrating of excellence and of virtues like personal responsibility, that could be one more recent contributor to the meaning crisis. I just want to put on the table that I think people like Peterson and Verveke would point to the scientific and Copernican revolutions leading to just a fundamentally different metaphysics that causes people to think that less is at stake when they're choosing how to behave whether to adopt personal responsibility. So, okay, you know, so let me say one other thing. Yes. Okay, one other thing. Okay, <laughs> so I just want I want to put yeah. that on the table. Yeah. One other thing that you said that I that made me pause is that you made a kind of uh, I mean it's not it's obviously not like this is a, a thing that many people say. Peterson talks about it. Steven Pinker obviously talks about it and you talk about it. Like things have never been better with regard to life expectancy, access to not just food and drink and really high quality varied food and drink but also access to edification and information and education it's like things have never been better right um and you know poverty is falling at a really high rate still all of those things okay so those are all reasons for optimism um but i just want to register or put on the table that i think people like hall and hall and schmackenberger would not disagree with that they would just say that it's not going to last. And then they have a whole argument about why it's not going to last. Um, and what we, what we need to do in order to maximize the likelihood that things can stay this good and get better. So again, I, I don't think like, it's an important point. It's an important corrective to some of the more pessimistic interpretations of our current state that you might hear, particularly those I would say that come from the left that are just always focusing on inequality and poverty. And it's like, well, actually, you know, there's a reason to be optimistic about the direction we're moving with regard to poverty, certainly. Um, so, I think, so I think what you say is an important corrective to those narratives, the more left-wing narratives about how exploitation and inequality and poverty are like, should be our central emphasis. You could say, okay, even if you think that, there's reason for optimism. But again, I think the concern of Schmachtenberger, um, Hall and some other, like Noam Chomsky talks a lot about uh, some of the same issues that Hall and Schmackenberger talk about, or, or basically, again, here I'm just repeating myself, it's not that what you're saying is untrue. It's not that things aren't better than they've ever been in a number of important respects. What is true, though, is that unbelievably power, powerful um, thermonuclear weapons are proliferating. We are developing the capacity to edit and manipulate genes, which could lead to the, syn this, the synthesizing of horrible viruses, and, and those could be deployed by malevolent actors. We are, we might be, I don't know, irreversibly degrading our natural habitat, which is the substrate on which we depend. We still are earthbound, okay? Um, and our technological capacities may be growing may start growing, like they're growing exponentially and they may really take off soon due to AI. Um, and 
And also because we're so interconnected, crises are now global in scope. They're not localized the way they used to be, even with something like the Black Plague or the Bronze Age collapse, which actually didn't affect that high a percentage of humanity. So you put all that together, that's why they're pessimistic. And, they're, and like our current sense-making structures are not adequate to the task of dealing with these problems. And we need to create these new ones. So again, I just like, I think that would be their response. And frankly, mine to this more optimistic view that like things have never been this great. It's like true, but is it sustainable? So, and, and, and if it's not sustainable, very important. And this is, I think the question that Holland Schmackenberger are, I mean, they're very interested. This is what game B game B for them is like, how do we create new sense making structures? Now I'm using rebel wisdom jargon, but how do we create new sense making structures that, uh, that allow us to co confront these, these Yeah, and I, I, I think that Sam yes. Harris would push back very forcefully in, in saying that science actually does present an option for ethics and, and common sense, really. And it's the same thing that I've said before, where, where, where you put life as the absolute. Yes. It's what Daniel is saying as well. It doesn't really make much sense. That's a small leap to make. And I think you can make that leap when you have worked through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Wait, right? sorry, make what leap? Make the leap towards life as the absolute, that you are not going to mistreat other people, that you, you know that you're not going to manufacture a weapon or nuclear weapons that are going to destroy the other guy because we're all in this thing together. And you can do that once you've hit your hierarchy of needs. Do you really think that's true? Because even if... It, well, I mean, that's his, his theory in a sense, like individually. If, if he, Sam Harris's? No, no, Maslow. Oh, like, ma so, oh I see. Right? Yeah. So his higher, like in his hierarchy of needs. Oh, when, sure. Yeah. Right, right. Well, but, 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 but it's I, important I've never, that we... I've never articulated this publicly, but, and I'm sure there's no way no one has had this thought, but like, if we know that wealth is not zero sum, person A being rich does not necessarily occur at the expense of uh, person B's wealth, that both can rise, um, even if they rise at different levels that the overall amount of material abundance in the world can increase. We totally know that, okay. But, um, so wealth is not zero sum, but status is zero sum. Status is zero sum. So with taxes. <laughs> sure. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so is... No, is, yeah, no, no. Right? I mean, t taxes are too, but like, um, a rising tide can lift all boats. You can eliminate poverty. What you can't eliminate I mean, this is kind of the dream of the left, although they will deny this if you push them on it, but it's sort of to eliminate status hierarchies. But, um, but the point is, even if everyone is getting richer, even, even if wealth is not zero, some status is. That is, if you have 10 people, they all can't be number one, right? Um, they, they can all be extremely wealthy, but they can't all be like number one. Do you think that all people want to be number well, one? Well, I was going to say, so like, even if people satisfy their um, hierarchy of needs, you're not going to eliminate evil. You're not going to, you're not going to eliminate <laughs> resentment because you're not at the top of the status hierarchy. So, so here's where I would right? add, to, add to what we were saying earlier. Things continue to improve by increments. You know, we went through the civil rights movement. Prior to that, thinking globally wasn't even really a concept. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a much more adversarial game. I wouldn't even say it was a dialogue. <laughs> it was just a much more adversarial game. I think we're still caught up in that and we're working our way through it. It's just that it's a global playing field now. It's just not Europe. They were fighting with each other for a long time. And it's not even like Europe was united in some kind of way. Spain suffered dearly for its sins. Right, right. Uh, yeah, economically, right. Oh, oh yeah. for sure. Right. They may have helped colonize stuff, but they sure did suffer. So there's a price to pay. And I think that that's a scientific data point that will align with the standard of ethics that you can use to move through life. It doesn't... Do you agree in, in the, in the uh, Harris-Peter, because this, I mean, the fundamental disagreement between them was whether you can derive ethics from empirics, whether you can derive values from facts. Whether um, I think you can. Yeah. See, I don't. I don't see how. Uh, it's not that 
your knowledge of of history and relevant facts won't influence your ethical view, but it's just that I think Peterson's position is that I might know everything there is to know about how horrible suffering is subjectively for humans and what precisely causes it. I might know all of those things, and I might know all there is to know about how wonderful beauty and meaning and happiness are for humans and all the thing, all there is to know about how to bring it about, and I might choose suffering and mayhem just because I'm sadistic. Right, you know? and, and you might be in the minority, and in doing so, you could not move through society. Wait, but hold on, but if you agree with that, then you agree with Peterson that the facts don't speak for themselves ethically. That is, you still need a person who has to decide what am I going to do now that I know the facts, and they can choose to alleviate suffering and maximize beauty and meaning and happiness, or they could choose otherwise. People always have, like, people will always choose. I mean, they well, do this with their own okay, lives. Okay, but Harris, Harris's view is that evil is basically a form of ignorance. That if a person had full information, they would not do evil. They would do what is right. I think that is Harris's view. And I think that uh, that may be part of the, the Hindu Upanishads, that if you strip away evil to its essence, it's ignorance. But Peterson's view is no. No, I don't. You can be a real sadist. You sure, can, sure. There's malevolence is, is a part of, you know, and, and th That's not necessarily rooted in ignorance, though. No, it's deliberate. Okay, well, you know, I, I think it's, that... It's if, absolutely deliberate. People I, I think will, that if you think that, I think that if you think you could have all of the I don't, scientific information about suffering, what it's like and what causes it, and all the scientific information about beauty, meaning, and happiness and what causes that, if you think that you could have all of that information, that a human being could have all of that information and still choose to maximize or contribute to suffering... No um, doubt. No doubt. Well, that, then yeah. I think that yeah, means yeah. you align with Peterson. That, that, I that do you, align with him in a, in a lot of ways, in that debate, but I would also... In that debate. Well, but I would make the, the case that... Um, Re reality will smack you in the face. Sure, go ahead and, and engage malevolence. That oh, fair enough. It's not practical. Know, it's it's not sure. pragmatic to so, be evil. So so yeah. you know, there's a certain amount of self interest and self preservation to a degree. And sometimes people they just become mass shooters and they don't care. Right. They they know. But that's a problem. They, that, that's one thing that Schmackenberger and Hall worry about because now we have weapons. Like increasingly, we're going to have weapons that allow people who just want to cause mayhem and suffering and maybe just. Maybe our anti-natalists just don't want human beings to exist at all. In increasingly, we're moving into a world where like, those individuals can wreak some serious havoc. Sure, it's a minority. It's an intense doesn't, minority. It doesn't matter if it's a minority. It, it sure. doesn't matter if it's a minority if, if they can build a weapon of mass destruction, either biological or, or thermonuclear. It, because that's part of Hall and Schmappenberger's argument, that like one consequence of this rapid technological growth is that now we're putting weapons of mass destruction in the hands of more people, some of whom may be inclined toward evil. And again, it's, yeah, that doesn't mean that we should stop living and stop, you know, walking out of our front door every morning, but it, but it might mean that they're right to be worried, like very worried. Well, I mean, it's, and it it's, sounds like you're not totally disagreeing with that. I, I want to be careful to totally accept it as well, because I feel like to to get a weapon of mass destruction, it becomes increasingly more difficult. Think about Al, think about Al Qaeda though. It wasn't one person, but it was it was an organization. Sure. sure. That I mean, I think you would probably argue. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would argue <laughs> as as you would. You know, yeah. it's there. There are always terrorists. Mm -hmm. You are never going to be able to eradicate that element of life. There's always danger, and it's a concern about just living life and science. Peterson makes this argument, and 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 I think he's right about it. We might think that this is the best way forward, but of course, if we destroy ourselves, right, turns out we made the wrong choice. We exactly. took the wrong path. No, exa exactly. Right, right. Yeah, and Chomsky says maybe it's better to be stupid than smart. And um, and I from, from a Darwinian point of view. Yeah. And and so I, I don't think that's in our makeup. You, the, know? The, like, what, you don't think to, that what is in our makeup? To take that choice to be stupider rather than smart. Well, no, we made I mean, our choice. Sorry, what Chomsky meant is like the species that are less cognitively capable than us may be better adapted to species level survival than us because we can fabricate the means of our own extinction, whereas like armadillos and ants can't. 
Right. That, that's that argument. We can't change the way we're made up. And so one of, of the, course, you know, one yeah. of the responsibilities for life is to be able to engage the shadow side as well in context of the culture that, well, the society that we live in, knowing that, that other people can create just as much chaos. And you deliberately move forward in the world when that shadow side is triggered, trying to maintain your calm, not to let it out. Right. And that's the virtuous way forward. But also not to repress it. You know, sure, to, not to, to be in, like, to like a scared, not yeah. to be a scared rabbit, right. you know, but, but... Become the sword and the sheath, the civilized beast. That's the part of wisdom that, that helps the masses of people understand how to move forward in a heroic way and deal with challenges that are unjust. If you accept at least some version of the pessimistic take, which is that there are multiple existential or quasi-existential risks, nuclear proliferation, degradation of the natural substrate, earth and its resources, the capacity to genetically manufacture deadly, highly virulent viruses, and the exponential growth in information processing through artificial intelligence. That all of those, combined with the high degree of inter global interconnectedness leading to fragility, okay, that all of that puts us in a pretty perilous or precarious state. So if you accept some version of that, that we are in a perilous, precarious state, and that, that's definitely what they think. Like, I mean, I think I heard Jordan Hall say that we're at end of life. <laughs> um, so the question is, okay, what do we do? So, so I'm curious what you think about this set of ideas. Okay, so their argument, I think, is we need a process that generates high-quality solutions to these crises, to the crisis of nuclear proliferation, to the, to the climate crisis, to the potential problem of bio-warfare, to the potential problem of artificial superintelligence that isn't aligned with human interests or the interests of life. Okay, so we, those are major crises and global interconnectedness, meaning that crises are no longer localized in the way that they used to be. Okay, so put all that together in a crisis. Okay, so if you agree with that, they argue we need a process that generates high quality solutions to those crises. That's obvious. High quality solutions would contain information that is true, delivered truthfully, representative. So having high quality information, having access to high quality information, is like a hugely important part of generating those high quality solutions to these crises. And then the argument is, since World War II, the process that we have used to generate solutions is what they call Game A. It's also associated with this concept of the Blue Church. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Jordan Hall and the yeah. Red Religion. Right, exactly. They're not interchangeable. Like game A does not equal, I think the Blue Church is like an example or like a manifestation of Game A. Um, but in any case, okay, so since we're, and this is just as I understand, I could be wrong. Since World War II, our process of generating solutions to the problems we face has been game A. Okay, what is game A? Well, it's, it's a top-down, centralized system. Um, okay, this is important. So, like, no individual has the time, the training, the cognitive ability, the evolved capacity to hold, much less analyze or come up with solutions to these massive crises. I mean, first of all, we're not evolved to think at the global level or sure. in a really long term, but in a really long term way. Further, we're just very cognitively limited and we're busy, right? Um, and some of us are dumb. So, so none of us has the time training, evolved capacity to grasp and analyze these complex problems we face. So the game A model is, okay, well, we need to have authorities who produce the solutions and implement them and communicate them to the masses. Um, and these authorities are political elites, economic elites, okay, so like presidents, uh, secretaries of state, etc. Economic elites, the CEOs of major corporations, um, media elites, Anderson Cooper, right? The, you know, the, the, the owners and the anchors or the writers, I guess, for organizations like CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. Cultural elites, Hollywood would be a good example. Um, educators, professors, right? Experts, right? So that's game A. We need to have authorities who can produce good solutions and uh, implement them, be given authority over organizations, and also communicate these solutions to the masses. Okay, so their argument is get this game A, this top-down, centralized, kind of hierarchical, authority-based system, is it's dead. 
it's over, it's ineffective. Jordan Hall compared it to like a dinosaur whose brain is like deceased, but the body is still <laughs> flailing around. Uh-huh. It's just hilarious. He has great like, he has yeah, great analogies. Both of them, especially <clears throat> yeah. Hall, incredible yeah. use of metaphor. Yeah. And sometimes they say not dead, but like senescent in their eighties, right? The game is in its eighties. And and then like drilling down a bit about why that is, okay, it's because it's for a few reasons. First of all, very often the authorities don't rise to their positions because of merit. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. A good example would be someone like, I mean, I know this is like a contentious issue and I don't really want to get into partisanship here, but like Trump is not a particularly shrewd, wise commentator or analyst on the crises we face, right? And, and democracy is partly responsible. The people don't necessarily elect the, po- the political elites who are most competent or authoritative, truly authoritative. Also things like equity hiring and affirmative action, right? Yes. Like in, yes. in, the, in yes. the academy, they're making that rather than just pure meritocratic mm-hmm. criteria. Sure, right? which okay. is problematic. Yeah, I agree that's problematic. Okay, so okay, so why is gay may senescent or dead? One, some of our authorities actually don't get there because of merit. That is the meritocracy that game A is supposed to be built on isn't always functioning. Whatever problems that were really big problems from the past, obviously, we got here. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. so that's why I'm optimistic about the future. Is It's one of these things that I, I like how Sam Harris made this kind of analogy. I'm not sure if he was talking to Joe Rogan, um, but he said something like, the presidency is one of the most powerful, important positions in the entire planet. You would think that you would see Oh, yeah. Like, you know, the intellectual. Wisest, right? right, the wisest, yes. most brilliant. And, and yes. It would be right. like, like yeah. the intellectual sl- NBA slam dunk yeah, contest right. that one would come up and impress you more so than the other. Right. right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, I, and I just love that. And, and you would think so. And I think that one of the problems that, that's a challenge it, with that is that that position has no end of criticism and you're a target. Yes. It's. People you know, blame the president for everything that happens. That's not... A, and the coronavirus is a great example of that. Absolutely. Trump is, like, absolutely. Yeah. All the way down to, to the, the microscopic level, the most ridiculous conspiracies. If you're really smart, you're just not going to do that. Like, right. Why? Yeah, and if you have... And, you're and a target. If you have noble priorities, too. I mean, like, you might not be willing to just prostitute yourself to donors f- for... 15 years like yeah. in order to rise up the ranks and and, 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 and lie in all the ways that you have to lie absolutely the that, this is a problem yeah. that we're it's facing around problems. the world yeah. that we're all facing that we cannot relate to people on on the basis of their character and on merit and on excellence but on some identity yeah. like issue which causes infinitely more problems because then I don't know if you got your job because right. you're good at what you're doing. You know, Thomas Sowell said that, uh, I think it was on Charlie Rose, uh, but he was asked, Charlie Rose, I, I, Charlie Rose is such an, I'm sorry, it's like, he's such an idiot. Like, um, but, you know, just in characteristic Charlie Rose fashion was like, now, you know, t- kind of condescendingly, like, why do you oppose affirmative action? You know, how could you possibly hold that bad opinion? And Thomas Sowell, like he just said, it delegitimates my accomplishments. So just what you're saying. Well, People and, look and at me does. and they assume I've, I was hired because I'm a black man. That's right. Yeah. Brett Weinstein. Mm-hmm. That guy's smart. He's very smart. That guy's, dude, and, those Weinstein. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> they're, they're, and, they're slightly insane, but smart. <laughs> he brought up something that I think his wife actually like mentioned, which was that the move towards identity as an indicator of value was really a sleight of hand trick from the left that was a cheaper alternative than labor. Right. Oh, and, yeah, that's, and I think oh, yeah, that that's, that's, that's a chilling sort of way of looking at Adolf Reed. Adolf Reed makes exactly that argument that it's um, the choices on offer in American politics now are diverse neoliberalism or he says white supremacist neoliberalism, basically like, you know, diversity focused uh, with, without changing the economic system or not focusing on... So I, I think one of the challenges that, you know, before we get to gain B, yeah. is that we have to get past this. And I actually think that the internet really helps with that because we're engaging in conversations with people from around the world in a way that removes that right. element of... Oh, yeah, the, I, emperor, the emperor has no clothes. Well, right? and like, so this whole conversation yeah. of identity may be a part of, like, game A. 
And that's the part. Tot- oh, it totally yeah. is. You I know, mean, that, it's, that, that, it's, it's, propagated, I would, it's propagated by the media elites and the academics. Like, sure. But, and, 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 and Hollywood. And, and the it is the reason why Trump got it into is, office. It because is. Because most people... And, and, it's part, and, it's, and I think that also plays a role in why populists are winning across the world, not just in the United States. You know, I, I think that there is a wisdom to the populist vote and culture that is not immediately apparent to the elites. Yeah. You know, right. that they just they, think that, right, just deplorables, right? Right, right yeah. that they're yeah. deplorables, but Ignorant. really... Ignorant or morally deficient or... But really, the, the value of living in a melting pot in America in the way that we do is that your identity, the way you look, is... Apparent maybe for a half a second, yeah. if that, yeah. because we've all grown up in a melting pot, yeah. especially in, in, in this northeastern right. kind of area. So you, you go to the store, you go to the gym, you, you interact with people all the time that, are, that right. look different than the way you look. Like identity is just not part of the equation. Right. So to have that be pulled into the conversation is such an element of artificial like game theory that it just doesn't register for everybody. They're like, this is ridiculous. It's, and, and they don't it, want it, any part of it. They reject it. Right. Even a lot of the Democratic electorate rejects it. Like, that's not why they vote for the Democratic Party. Like, they're not pro-woke, you know? I mean, actually, a lot of African-American voters, you know, they support Biden, not yeah. um, the more woke candidates. Um, and, and Coleman Hughes talked about that when he came, that like 60% of, I think it was like maybe lower income African Americans or working class African Americans don't think that race has been a significant barrier to progress in their lives. And this yeah. is where I would say, like where I feel optimistic about the technology, because the common man can access quality conversation right. and, and information that makes sense in a way that the news media is not. Right. It's why that whole Kathy Newman thing went viral. Yes. That, that was the perfect example of... And it goes viral because the common man is, is hungry for that level of genuine engagement. So there's this little story that I heard years ago related to that. I'll have to paraphrase, uh, and I'll probably get it like somewhat jumbled. But in any case, there was a young journalist who went into this TV station and the guy who's a veteran there said do you know what we're doing here you know filled with sort of virtuous optimism Mm -hmm. he said oh sure we're trying to report the news in an unbiased objective manner and veteran just laughed at him he said not at all what we're trying to do is keep the audience engaged see all these people working here all these people need to be employed they all have jobs they have families they have kids they go to school they have everything we're desperately trying to make it from one commercial that's paying everybody's bills to the other commercial. And whatever is happening in the middle, you just do what you can to keep viewers. And, and wow. that's, is yeah. That, yeah. That's, so, a, that's an amazing summation of, yes. of really what's going on in game A. Yeah. You know, and you don't really have to hear that story. You just have to be alive today to know that what they're feeding us is very much like the Kathy Newman uh-huh. kind of set of answers, like canned answers. God, and that was so moronic. I'm, it's kind of amazing how like not embarrassed by that they and she were. <laughs> like, and, and Jordan Hall speaks about that too. Yeah. It's like, like that they, she had a set of answers yeah. that she could relate to, yeah. and it actually made her look worse than she really had to look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the very thing that people instinctively want to get past. Right. Right. And so they're just going online. Like, that's why, like... Yeah, and I think what you're describing is part of the transition from game A to game B. Okay, so I already mentioned one problem is that a lot of the authorities don't have much merit, and we kind of talked a bit about that. Another reason why game A is over is that these elites and the institutions they work for have incentives to provide shitty solutions, right? To provide information that isn't helping us get to a solution. It's information that is either dishonest, that is not true... We just talked about how that happens in the media. I could talk about it in academia, how the personal motivations of academics, how peer review processes are, don't do anything. Also, ideas don't spread, and this is is an argument that Schmackenberger makes more, ideas don't spread and get internalized by people because they're true necessarily. They might just be well argued, they might be well marketed, um, they might be psychologically effective in in tapping into people's fear and desires. They might be proselytized. Like one example they give is like Jainism 
is actually a pretty solid religious viewpoint in the sense that it really does start from the sacredness of life, right? What we're talking about. But it's not a proselytizing faith. Islam and a lot of forms of Protestantism are. So why is gay may failing? Authorities often don't have merit. Often the elites and their organizations don't have incentives to, to, to give high quality information. Three, ideas don't spread because they're true necessarily. And fourth, and maybe this isn't a great breakdown, but fourth, the institutions are just old and exhausted. Like the Weinsteins have talked a lot about, like Eric Weinstein talks a lot about how everyone running the game mains, he doesn't use gay game terminology, but everyone running the kind of established institutions across the board, politically, economically, et cetera, are boomers. And they need to get out of the way because they don't know what's happening. Yeah, Jordan Hall says something yeah. similar. So, and like even Hollywood, increasingly lacking in creativity, just reproducing old ideas and sensationalizing. Sure. sure. So that was a not great summary of why game A is over. And they argue that game B is necessary and in its infancy. Now, what is game B? Well, in contrast to game A, which is top-down, centralized, and involves deferring to authorities, game B is decentralized, self-organizing, collective. Often it summarizes decentralized collective intelligence. What does that mean? Well, it means networks of conversation through the internet, as you were saying, rather than authorities broadcasting to the masses, right, right. more right. symmetrical, more... Yep dialogical rather than unidirectional. Um, it means Bitcoin, not fiat currency. It means open source software where everyone can play a role in generating the software. It means hashtag movements dictating politics rather than the official pronouncements or arguments put forward by politicians. For one example of that would be like during the Kavanaugh hearings. It was really hashtag me too and hashtag resistance that engulfed the mm -hmm. official political conversation rather than the official political conversation dictating the narrative, right? It was really Twitter dictating the narrative and the politicians like scrambling to respond to it. So just to summarize, we have all these crises. Yep. We need solutions to the crises. At present, the institutions that generate the solutions are still game. We're still in game A. Yeah. Like they yeah. still have market share or market dominance, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but they're shitty. And we need to move to game B and game B is in its infancy. Does that gel with what you took from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. It's what makes me feel optimistic. Mm -hmm. It's that we can have this conversation and there are a hundred other people having the conversation and there are a million of other people watching it and then having more conversations about right. it. And, and that's what's making the change. And that's always in the history of humanity what's made the change. It's where I would look to the past and remain hopeful about institutions that were outdated, that had a real authoritative grip on people. Some institutions lasted for you know, a thousand years. Right. right? And, uh, and the and Catholic was, Church giving way to the Protestant Reformation is a great example of this. Sure. Or, the, or giving way to the Renaissance. Yeah, know, right. Yeah. You, know, yeah. And you can't hold people back. They'll figure out a way. And become, a kind of bottom-up organic way. Absolutely. Like, the ideas that really land with people sure. are going to rise to the top and get disseminated instantaneously. Yes. Right? Like what I'm still, so it's, what it's, I'm really unclear on is like how that energy can be harnessed and directed and filtered up to decision making. That's why like I'm vague on what game B might look like. And I, and that's not a critique of Hollow and Schmack. No, I know. It's more like I just don't. It's the same I haven't issue that, well, yeah. it's the same issue that I have in a sense with that whole project is I find it's really easy and advantageous to point a finger of criticism at what already exists mm. because like there's the target and you know you can objectively look at it and say flaw 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 all the way through and and, and you know 360 but it's the best thing we got what, at the moment what is the best thing we've got game a is that what you mean at the moment it's the best thing it's although, what got us although to one, this. Th one thing that's great about hall and schmackenberger is that they don't just say the way so many people often do oh you know it's just like the amazon documentary it's like what are you proposing as an alter right what i mean is like what one option in life is just to take existing institutions and criticize them period but at least holland schmackenberger are give, are trying to articulate a game B. so yeah. and what's wonderful about like what i see happening on the internet and what's increasingly like more a part of like the intellectual ethos or just the the popular ethos is that people aren't as willing to just give in to the ideas of authority and right you know yes, so they right. want to have a conversation 
and very quickly. Well, right, Dana is breaking down because because it's, people no, it's like Ember right. no longer has clothes, right? That's right? Have you seen the video of Anderson Cooper? He's reporting from a place that experienced a hurricane, that suffered a hurricane, and he's submerged in water up to his chest. But then there's a picture of how it's just a video set. I mean, it's just it's just a completely fabricated scenario. Um, I did not see that. Yeah, but but it's but but anyway, it's like um, right. People are kind of calling bullshit sure. increase, increasingly, yes. right? Yes. Like across like yes. academia. I mean, like the critiques of academia that I put forward, not just me. Obviously, I'm I'm just really people like Jonathan Haidt and Peterson are putting forward. Whether it's that, whether it's like critique of the media, of the mainstream media. Well, it's all online now. Yeah, right. Exactly. So yeah. You, the the game yeah. that worked, the strategies that worked in game A, they don't work anymore. They don't work anymore. Yeah. There's. Along every dimension, anything that happens, the Lindsay Shepard affair, right? Right. What, you know, right. anything from that, the smallest little thing, it's online and everybody knows yeah. about it. And, yeah. and, and, then, and then the people can really decide. Sure. Like the people can really decide. They can actually hear what happened. Right. Not hear the president of Wilfrid Laurier's version of what happened. Sure. Right? They, can, they can see it. Yeah. You right. know, or, or, and then they can compare. Uh -huh. okay, what is the official narrative and what, is, what actually happened in this room? That's right. It's like Inquisition. <laughs> Never before have we yeah. been able to hold that level of truth. That that's why be a cause for optimism. Well, right? yeah, I, like, and I do think that. I think that like that's why Rogan is so popular. Rogan is like if you want to summarize game A. Actually, Rogan probably isn't. If we think of institutions that best capture or instantiate or exempl exemplify game A, what would we say? Okay, Rogan is a great example. What else? Do you think he's game A? Is, is oh, no, sorry, no, game B. Game B. Yes. Sorry, game B. Okay. Right. So, so right. it's a great example of game B. Well, I think he's, I brought him to the fore in that way because I, I just think he's so attractive along so many different dimensions and he gets such an audience far more than, than anybody on than anyone else. Yeah, and, he, and, and, and he's so humble. Like, he doesn't... And he's, he's yet he's curious. asking very good questions. Yeah. Um, and it's that type of hero that people respond to because he's the ordinary man. I have concern about people that, that will say, you know, the boomers just need to get out of the way because mm. it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There's uh, a lot yeah. of knowledge that's there. You don't just want to remove it mm -hmm. and put something else in there that hasn't taken... That's right. It's the problem with revolutions. Right. right. They just... Right. So what... Oh, oh, although, game B, it's a very, again, organic, bottom-up... It's like getting rid of the boomers. The idea is allow game b to assert itself but game b is not top down revolutionary we're going to impose some new abstract ideology on the world and see how it goes it's more like the very nature of game b is bottom up organic best ideas rise to the top it doesn't seem as susceptible to the problems associated with wiping slates clean and just implementing something new that we've seen in past revolutions again thinking about just what game b is Rogan is a great example of it. Jordan Hall, I think he said like the best example of it is QAnon, which is something I didn't follow closely at all. I didn't follow that yeah. closely either. Um, that's actually something I'd like to learn more about because it may be the best concrete illustration of what they're talking about. Hmm. Obviously, one, one advantage to everyone dialoguing is there's more collective intelligence in a million citizens than there is in any like group of elites. Um, and if you can find ways of extracting and synthesizing all of the insight from those million individuals, that is going to be superior. But another, another way that like dialogue and symmetry rather than monologue and asymmetry is good is that, and th this I know to be true from musical composition, um, and this was the example I think given by Hall. If you have two musicians, they can, by listening to each other's riffs and ideas, produce something far better than anything that either could have produced individually, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's like each person, they can't quite get there on their own, but person B can supplement what person A can't quite articulate, and person A can help supplement what part person B can't quite articulate, and then it all starts to come together, sure. you know? Sure. Um, so I don't think yeah. you're going <clears> to, <throat> I don't think that we're going to be able to remove authority. Authority, yeah. You know, and, and, of course. and excellence. Because some, some people know, some people are better. Well, it's yeah. a Pareto principle Jordan issue. Hall, right? you know? like, yeah, yeah, sure. Right, yeah. So. We'll have the conversation, you know, because 
you know, they're at, 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 at a higher point in that apex than, than we are. Yes. And then other people will have the conversation, you know, and, and it sort of extends in that way. It's like watching sports figures. Right. And you watch Michael Jordan, but there's only one. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But then there's just a million that are inspired to play. And, and Sure. But Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger are not saying we need to become the new authorities. I only got this today, actually, when I was listening to them. They are talking about moving away from a system of deferring to authority, but instead having something that is much more decentralized so I think and, and kind of outputs solutions. It's more like a process, outputting solutions, rather than authoritative individuals. So you know how Peterson brings up uh, the lobster mm -hmm. and uh, as being part of, like, the reason why he does that is, is how deep the programming is for a hierarchy and innate yeah. sort of need to be looking to, like, that hierarchy mm -hmm. for, like, an authority. I don't well, think... It's more like wanting to be, like, knowing your place in it and having that affect your... Well, it's also knowing, like... Being um, aware of it. Sure. Yeah. That just to be alive, you kind of understand like some element of the Pareto principle, right, right. you know, and, and so people look for leaders and we require like good ideas. And there are some people that will solve problems, right, right. you know, that, that take hundreds of years, yes. you know, right. Uh, right. like Waldemir Hofkin, right? Uh -huh. Like he'll solve the, the plague and, and that's only one person. And don't be thinking that like just millions of people didn't try and solve that over the course of what, like... I don't know what, 700 years, 500 years, and just hundreds of years. We'll always look to that and, and we'll always be inspired. But I think that what we're seeing is is that the public will be able to be engaged with the conversation. I see, as right. Well. right. And that will elevate our level of engagement and the, the transparency will just become, we won't be able to hide in a way that we've always previously been able to hide corruption. And so, so to some extent you think we're not going to dispense with like appealing to authority, obviously, because I was having the same thought and that's why it was interesting to me to see that like, it seems like Hall and Schmackenberger to some extent are talking about dispensing with that idea. But if we say that's that right, that's yeah, what I thought too. Yeah. I was like, you can't. Yeah. Just right. Look at nature. Right. Um, but if, but if we're not, I think, right. If we're still going to have authorities, at least... They'll be much more transparent. Right. The authority is, is going to be more merit-based. So I think right. what, what um, makes Peterson so attractive mm -hmm. is, is his transparency. So he's not posing. He yeah. looks the part. My idea is, is that it's someone like that that makes it, penetrates into the consciousness and alters, radically alters your entire conception of reality and how you're going to move forward. Because you might have still been on that same path right. had he not been here. Right. But had he showed up earlier when you were 14 or 15, it might have just started you on that path that much sooner. I think it would have. You, know, you cannot help but have that kind of virtue like injected into your blood. And it, it just changes your entire conception of reality and makes you a better person. Where I'm, I might say that you can't take on the responsibility of other people's welfare you do so by being a virtuous person, by having that conversation, by being the better person that you are and moving through the world in that way. Right, like, right, you know, right. Like, that is how you... No, that, no, again, yeah. I think virtue is, in effect, sacrificing for the well-being of others, even if you don't look at it that way. But it's no sacrifice. Well, it's, it's... it's sacrificing certain things. It involves practicing restraint and discipline. And I'm not saying there isn't very good reason to be virtuous, but it does. it's not easy to be virtuous. It's not yeah, easy sure. to do what is right. It's not easy to be wise. But you do that hard work largely out of the recognition. If you practice the virtues, as you say, right, you do make the world sweeter, better for the people around you. And you might and you inspire people as well. So um, it's 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 kind yeah. of it's a whole virtuous circle because it lifts your self esteem. In having a better sense of yourself, you're more prone to be magnanimous with other people because your insecurities about like what a pathetic creature you really are are mitigated. You know the whole thing is the win win by striving for your like Freud's like super ego. Yeah, you, it, it just it, it is win win. Isn't it cool? That the thing you should do psychologically, even just if you're being kind of egoic about it, just trying to do what's in your own psychological best interest. Isn't it cool that what's in your 
psychological best interest to do is also yes like yes meaning maximizing for the rest of the lives yes. that's and suffering minimizing yes the yes the that's that's the case that Ayn Rand makes mm -hmm. in in the virtue of selfishness that's putting life making life as the absolute like it becomes so much why is it selfishness because you're doing it for yourself it's oh, the, I see. oh you know well, and you know peterson has said that the main thing he's doing is convincing people that it is in their yes. best interest yes not that it's their duty yes which he says is more of the conservative or like the typical kind of conservative right thing. right oh that's it. so it's lazy thinking to think that it's your duty but it's 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 in your self-interest yeah. Right. To, you know, like yeah. it all like yeah, fits actually, together. Actually, Peter Singer, who I don't particularly like, makes it the same argument now that I think about it. Ultimately, he doesn't make it convincingly, but he, ha he has articulated that ultimately the best reason to, to be ethical is that your life will be better if you are. Um, Obviously. Yeah. It's the obvious conclusion. But, you know, it's very hard to convince people of that. Because it means sacrificing all kinds of things that they may have gotten really used to. Well, temporary. Lying. Sure. Eating junk food all the time. Yes. Not being disciplined. Yes. Like, I'm really struggling right now with just being disciplined about my sleep schedule. Um, point is, it's just, you know, like, it's not easy. It's mm -hmm. not easy to... Mm -hmm. Because virtue is really a set of habits. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, I shouldn't have said, oh, sorry. I should have just done it. The point, the point was just do it. Yeah. Don't, don't yeah. mention it. Right? Um, anyway, I feel like we could talk forever.